I am Rohini Hensman. I come from Sri Lanka, but I live in India. And um, uh, I'm a feminist, a women's rights activist, and a labor activist. And those are the um, fields in which I work mainly. But um, the issue of communalism and secularism has come up in all, well, all the countries I'm involved in, and especially in India recently. So, uh, and, and I feel that that is a very crucial issue for women as well as for everyone else, of course. I mean, India is, by comparison with uh, most of the other countries of South Asia, it is a secular country, but not as completely secular as is believed. Even the constitution, which is on the whole quite admirable, has traces of uh, Hindu bias, uh, which have been pointed out, for example, by Pritam Singh. One, one uh, instance of this is um, the way in which Hindus are defined. Um, they are seen to include uh, Buddhists, Sikhs, and Jains, uh, which, of course, is absolutely not correct since these religions are quite distinct and many practitioners of them have objected to this inclusion. But it also um, seem, it creates a divide between these religions which are so seen as originating in India and therefore as being somehow um, more at home in India from uh, people who follow these religions from others, Muslims, Christians, Jews and Parsis whose religions are seen as coming from outside. And this has created problems. For example, there's this whole reservation policy for Dalits. Now, regardless of whether you see reservations as an appropriate form of affirmative action, the fact is that it is the only form of affirmative action at present for Dalits who are terribly socially oppressed. But as of now, unless things have changed in the very, very recent past, which I don't think they have. Christian and Muslim Dalits, that is Dalits who convert to Christianity or to Islam, don't get the same reservation rights as other Dalits. Uh, they have been excluded from getting the same reservation rights. And the, uh, the reasoning is quite uh, weird in a sense because it's, it's inconsistent. It says that because these new religions do not have a caste system, therefore uh, they should not get these rights. But the fact is that in India, um, a Dalit is a Dalit regardless of religion. They still suffer the same social oppression, plus in many cases extra oppression because of their religion. Um, so it and the, fa the fact that other Dalits from, from um, other communities, Buddhists and Sikhs, do get the reservations also, whereas they don't have a caste system or are not supposed to have a caste system, uh, it makes this totally inconsistent. It has been challenged legally. Uh, government commissions have said quite clearly that this is not, it's, in fact, it's been suggested even that it's unconstitutional because the constitution constitutes discrimination by the state against people of certain communities, uh, religious, on the grounds of religion. Um, but it still has not been lifted. I mean, no doubt there are complications as to what happens if it is, uh, if it is changed. But that is a, a, an instance of um, the state being non-secular, uh, lack of secularism. Of course, with respect to women, that is another uh, another case as well, very strongly. There, I think the biggest problem is the way in which secularism is interpreted in India. It is seen as treating all religions alike, um, which begs the huge question of who defines, you know, what a religion is, and by and large. Unfortunately, the way in which this uh, has been interpreted is that uh, religion is defined by the generally the most commoner, most fundamentalist elements of the religion uh, who follow that religion, and um, the more progressive types, the ones who are 
in favor of women's rights are not seen as representative of the religion. And I think that that problem is going to arise, arise if you define secularism in this way. Uh, so long as it's not defined as uh, treating all citizens alike or all people alike regardless of religion, but or, or all individuals alike regardless of their religion, but of teaching the religions alike, this problem is definitely going to arise. Who defines what the religion is and in that sense? So this has meant that basically in practice, however in much however secular the Indian state might be in theory, in practice, it has tended to um, to encourage the the, the more fundamentalist elements in all, in all religions, of course, which is most um, devastating uh, in the case of the Hindu uh, communal elements. But strengthening of the um, extremist elements in any religion tends to strengthen the same elements in the others. So, for example, at the time in the mid-80s, um, on the one hand, you had the Shabanu case, where um, the Supreme Court uh, judgment, which gave a really very um, a pathetic uh, um, amount to Shabanu, uh, was overturned as a result of a, 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 a fundamentalist backlash from Muslims. But what happened next was that then, in a sense, to follow this line of treating all religions the same, having made a concession to the Muslim uh, extremists, there was a need to make a concession to the Hindus, so the Babri Masjid was opened up for uh, yeah. for Hindus to worship there, which led, as we all know, into all hell broke loose after that, and uh, the problems have ceased to this day. I mean, we've had a huge growth of of Hindu communism after that, so many people killed and so on. Um, so I think that's a, a, a very big problem with the definition of secularism. And it goes together also with this, with the uh, existence of having different personal laws for, yeah. for different religions. Um, which also came up in the wake of the Shaban case, and where I feel the women's movement has really, well, it got divided on the issue, which should never have happened. Uh, one reason was that the, um, the Hindu right jumped on the bandwagon of the Uniform Civil Code uh, and used it as a stick to beat all Muslims with. Um, now I think what we should have said, all feminists should have said at that point is, okay, let's not use the term because uniformity is not the point. It could be uniformly anti-women, for example. That's not what we want. We want gender just family laws. Uh, and we do want secular family laws because on the one hand we are fighting for um, for equality before the law. Um, for example, um, in cases where um, Muslims are treated differently, as in all cases, whenever there's a, a riot, for example, you get Hindus being let, let off scot-free while often innocent Muslims are incarcerated. Um, and we, we protest against that as a case of not being equal before the law. So how can we then demand that they should not be treated equally when it comes to women? You know, so we, uh, I think that that there, there, of course, there are groups, many groups, uh, women's groups in India who, who stood by the issue, uh, by the um, demand for gender just um, laws, family laws. But the movement uh, was so badly split, so many. Uh, so many women and women's groups withdrew at the point when they felt that um, their demand was being used by the Hindu right. Instead of clearly differentiating themselves from the Hindu right by saying that it's not that we want uniformly Hindu laws or some, you know, uh, something that um, that gives into them. This, these points were all made by many women's groups, but for some reason it 
dissipated the whole uh, movement for gender just laws and it, uh, it is I think a, a real shame because you still have cases where women are treated very differently and, and it where you give, again it's a case of giving in to the fundamentalists I mean for example the uh, there are arguments including some by feminists some 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 women who say that for example that the rights given to women under Muslim personal law in some ways are stronger um, than those in um, in the in other religions and that one should not that there are problems in in um, homogenizing them but um, here as elsewhere I think it's the more fundamentalist types who get to um, to rule the roost I mean for example apparently it's uh, they have not in India today only Hindus can adopt can do legal adoptions people of other religions can't now if you ask why uh, it's the, apparently because Muslims some Muslims have said that that it's contrary to Islam to adopt now <laughs> it, first and foremost many Muslims do not agree with that I mean I have a friend who's adopted a daughter and so on it's just uh, it's not agreed by everyone but supposing even that it were the case, anyone should have access to an adoption law. It's not that if you believe that it's wrong to adopt, that the law is forcing you to do so. Likewise, other, uh, okay, maybe a devout Catholic will not want to get divorced or remarry. That's fine. A law which allows you to do so does not force you to do so. So it doesn't contradict your conscience. If you have, if you have um, conscientious objections to doing something which you are allowed to do by law, uh, you're, you're not forced to do so. These are enabling laws that we're talking about. So I think uh, the reason why they object is not so that they will not be forced to do something against their conscience, but to stop other people from having the option, uh, which I think is wrong. And I, I feel we should be arguing more strongly and more unitedly uh, on this issue and it I think impinges a lot on, on various other issues as well. I mean for example things have changed I think for the worse after 9-11. I mean earlier on there was still impunity often for you know pogroms against Muslims. Yeah, Hindus who perpetrated them were often got away scot free, in fact all almost always. But um, after after 9-11 the image of Muslims as terrorists has been used very quite systematically. And the um, strategy I think of Hindu communists has changed. They not rather than going for pogroms as much as they did before. They are now adopting the same tactics, making bombs, um, setting them off in, in, in um, near mosques, etc., or in, in marketplaces. But, and, and it is known, I mean, they have found cases of uh, bombs being made or, of, um, and attacks being done by Hindu groups. But Whenever anything happens, the first reaction is it's done by Muslim terrorists. However irrational it seems, the police uh, always say so. When they do discover that it's that it is that is not the case, their findings are never publicized. Politicians again almost. I mean, when the Bombay train bomb blast went off, I mean, within hours you had people saying. Uh, Prime Minister, in fact, saying it was people from Pakistan. Before any investigation has taken place, before any evidence has been collected, there is this kind of knee-jerk reaction. And in more and more cases, it's not true. I mean, they, they, they actually do trace uh, bombs. Uh, and the media, again, uh, are also culpable with a few honorable exceptions, like uh, Tehelka, I think, which reported these um, the bombs that were made during the Gujarat riots and so on. So 
Now, the way this has, again, this has impacted on, on Muslims is to drive them to strengthen the more fundamentalist elements in our women, which again is extremely negative for women. And uh, here, I mean, I'm not, I have not visited Gujarat after the riots, but one hears of, of women being, you know, being kept even more uh, secluded, and, you know, under the authority of males in the family as a result. So, yeah, I, I think unless we have a, 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 a different definition of secularism which ties it in with equality and democracy and not with this idea, I think it's a sort of Gandhian idea of treating all religions equally, respecting all religions equally. I mean, there are things in all religions which we should not respect, why should we? I mean, that it doesn't mean disrespect to the person who follows a certain religion. If you say, you know, I don't agree with the way you treat people or in which uh, people of uh, lower caste are treated or in which women are treated, um, I think it, this idea that if you criticize a religion or disagree with some some tenet of a religion, uh, it's somehow disrespectful of the people who follow that religion is, is uh, should be discarded and the idea should be to protect all individuals, um, protect their rights, um, regardless of what religion they follow and regardless of gender as well because then uh, it, it almost becomes that in order to respect a religion you have to also respect the right of people following that, of men or certain um, elders to um, violate the rights of women, uh, which doesn't make sense to me. So it's, uh, we need to re redefine secularism in India, I think, if we have to make it work. Yeah, I mean, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, the, the primary um, conflict uh, has been uh, between, or oh, it is seen, or being, it has been uh, projected as being between Sinhalese and Tamils. But all along, Sinhalese have the Sinhalese extremists have couched their claims in terms of being guardians of Buddhism. So that there has been an element of there of, of uh, also of religion, um, which was put into the constitution, I think initially in 1972 that Buddhism was given a special place. It was then repeated in, in the 78 constitution which is still um, there today. So it is not even in, in the terms of the constitution a secular country. And um, this of course has been used uh, to um, to displace, for example, Tamils in the East, um, <coughs> wherever they discover some East and North, wherever they discover some uh, Buddhist or sometimes it's probably pretended, but even if they are genuine uh, Buddhist sites, uh, historical sites, that is taken to be proof that it was Sinhalese territory. Now, whereas there was a very strong Tamil Buddhist tradition in Sri Lanka and South India, which is completely obliterated. Um, so that, that, then there have also been attacks on, on Christians and attempts to put through um, anti-conversion laws, etc. So the, the, this Sinhalese Buddhist uh, identity uh, has become very strong and um, I feel that, that certainly that part of the constitution should be uh, should be changed. I mean, it, it should not. There should not be any special place for any any religion. Um, it has been one of the things which has led to the uh, to the civil war. But uh, I mean, I think equally disturbing is what has been happening in the north and east with the LTT. I mean, earlier around the Tamil. Uh, the Tamil speaking people as a whole were all feeling, you know, were all felt oppressed and um, when the, um, the 
army was attacking the North and East. They, they worked together even when the Indian army came in, the IPKF came in, uh, in 87. There was a kind of uh, uh, sort of a common front between uh, the, the entity uh, which seemed to be mainly uh, was seen as well, it wasn't actually. It was seen as a secular organization. But I think this changed very radically in 1990 when they, on the one hand, they expelled all the Muslims from the north. There were also attacks on mosques. Um, and this has introduced a communal element. Even into, I mean, I, I, I have no... Um, I, have, I have no admiration whatsoever for the LTT. I completely... Um, disagree with its politics and think it's a fascist organization. But at least up to that time, it had not uh, been openly communal. But this has opened the door, and I believe there are reports that, that the VHP has now, you know, had uh, made contacts in the, uh, or established itself in, in the North and East of Sri Lanka, which is very disturbing because this is now, it would, result in, in, in uh, introducing yet another conflict there between Hindus and Muslims, uh, which really has not been there in Sri Lanka earlier. I mean, and the uh, possibility of this is also greater because again, uh, the influence of outside, um, of a more fundamentalist type of, of uh, Islam has also been uh, in Sri Lanka for some years now. I mean, when I was at school, um, you could hardly tell, uh, you know, a Muslim girl from another. Uh, it's uh, um, you never ever saw headscarves, let alone veils. Um, but now you see it with even with you know children, uh, with with girls, and you see veils. Uh, not it's not as widespread uh, as maybe in um, in India, but striking because it was never there before. I mean that was not part of the Sri Lankan Muslim culture. So there is uh, a strength, and I feel if they if they remain under attack or feel they are under attack, this could push push more people into the arms of Muslim fundamentalists as well. So there is a, a real danger that this will escalate. And again, I think a very, very strong secular policy would be needed, which is certainly not forthcoming at the moment in Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, actually, the uh, emphasis on the singular Buddhist um, ideology and politics started in the 1950s, although it didn't uh, come into the constitution until much later in 72 and it really has it's really the genesis of the civil war I think it contradicts everything that I understand uh, Buddhism stands for you have had uh, Buddhist monks um, almost bane for blood. I mean, starting in 1956, there were riots, 58. Uh, again, there were anti-Tamil riots, and um, that was under uh, Bandara Naika, the, the, the Prime Minister. And when he, under pressure from uh, sort of more democratic forces, he, he was uh, preparing to back down from the Sinhala the making Sinhala the only official language. Uh, the legislation which did that and to allow Tamil to be used um, in some parts of the country. He was actually assassinated by a Buddhist monk. So this is not, um, I know it conflicts with everyone's conception of Buddhism and it, it is, I, I still believe in, in essence a uh, religion of non-violence. But it has certainly not been that in Sri Lanka. And it has escalated uh, to a point where it is um, used to justify violence. As of today, we, there is a, a party, the the JHU, the Jatikarela Urumaya, again a Buddhist monk party, 
which has stopped every attempt to um, to make a political uh, to formulate a political solution, a democratic political solution to the crisis there. So if the war carries on, it is really uh, down to both these, the LTT of course, but I would equally well say uh, the Sinhala Buddhist extremists. And in fact, in some ways they are more, I think, more responsible because they are the ones who led to the, the, the genesis of the whole problem. Uh, and certainly there, there might have been Tamil communalists before, but they would have remained, uh, uh, you know, a lunatic French who no, nobody took uh, seriously. Uh, for example, there were the pogroms in 1983. Before that, the LTT, I believe, consisted of something like 30 members. They were, and some of those were part-timers. After it, well, everyone knows what they have. They have developed into an extremely strong uh, military and terrorist organization, and that was the boost was given by this Sinhala Buddhist um, supremacist politics and uh, its extreme violence, which I think turned so many times uh, towards um, towards militancy, which they would not have done, and it is still happening. So. Uh, that is a case where definitely lack of secularism has destroyed, I think, as much Buddhism as the country that it claims to be uh, a haven of Buddhism. But the religion too has become unrecognizable as anything that associated with the teachings of the Buddha. But I sometimes think this, this does need to be recognized, for example, even in the case of Tibetan Buddhism, that it's not uh, necessarily um, the you know the peaceful non-violent principles which were taught by the Buddha which, which really prevail in the uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's absence of oppression uh, absence of oppression of women uh, of subordinates etc and it's certainly not the case in Sri Lanka either so I, I, when I see um, all these demonstrations in favor of Tibetan Buddhism, I sometimes think, uh, well, if it's any, anything like Sri Lankan Buddhism, um, I would not support it because it has certainly, I mean, it, it probably isn't, maybe not as bad, but, uh, but really the, the situation in Sri Lanka has very much been exacerbated by people who um, well, Buddhist monks, Buddhist, the, their followers, politicians who claim to be devout Buddhists um, and, and who are extremely bloodthirsty with it. Well, there are always, um, I mean, there are, there are always codes for women which are upheld by these, it's a, uh, it's, it's funny, I, mean, I, I think originally um, after independence, Sri Lanka was probably better off, women in Sri Lanka specifically were better off than uh, women in most other South Asian countries. They were more, much higher level of literacy, they were, um, participation in the labor force was very high. In fact, um, they have been the mainstay of the economy. Uh, throughout, but I see a, a huge um, increase in violence against women since then, um, and um, and a loss of respect for women, uh, you know, sexual harassment, rape, um, domestic violence, and so on. I think has has increased hugely, um, which. I haven't studied this, so I, I can't say anything um, sort of with any great assurance. But I, I put it down to the the growth of uh, extremism on on uh, both sides. Certainly, I mean, in the mainstream Buddhist society, I think there has um, really, I mean, status of women has fallen. If you look at the government. I mean, given the number of 
very you know, well educated, intelligent women in Sri Lanka. That's, you hardly see them in government, and I'm sure that's one of the reasons for the abysmal performance uh, of our governments. And they, they, in public life, they are, um, I mean, with the exception of, of, uh, of one prime minister and president, poor women, which shows also that they can, when they get a chance, um, sort of do well. But uh, the, apart from that, the, the, the number of MPs, for example, of women MPs, is extremely low. Ministers, hardly any. No, very, very few. So in that sense, I think the status of, of women has suffered. So far as the LTT is concerned, there's, a, I think, a very um, instrumental attitude to women. Um, it might look good that they are used as fighters and as suicide bombers, but I think that is also um, a way of saying that women's bodies are expendable. And there seems to be a division between the, those, between women, either as fighters or as, you know, as mothers, basically, you know, who ought to be uh, producing children. Uh, children who are fighters and they I mean this again is one of the things that has arisen uh, one of the con conflicts within the Tamil areas, the fact that children are conscripted so women's reproductive capabilities um, are seen as being um, basically not their own to control because their children are then supposed to be um, surrendered and used as fighters. And this is one thing that women in the North and East have been fighting. Of course, they have it's really very, very difficult for them. And I'm, again, I feel there has not been perhaps enough solidarity with the women who are fighting against uh, the conscription of their children, uh, which is such a horrendous thing that is going on in a big way by the LTT as well as by the TNVP, which split off from the LTT. Um, and it is condemned internationally at the, by international agencies and human rights agencies and the UN and so forth. But even in Sri Lanka, maybe not enough, uh, uh, there's not enough solidarity from other women for these women who are trying to fight against uh, the conscription of their children. So again, I think it's, it's uh, a certain uh, definition of women, which sees them as being subordinate, to, I mean, subordinate to uh, an authoritarian leadership, and and not having very much agency of their own. Yeah, I, I mean, um, this is very impressionistic because I have not really studied the situation here, but I, I see sort of con contradictory tendencies. I mean, on the one hand. Um, again, as a result of this war against terrorism, uh, there is a, a stereotyping of Muslims as being inherently violent um, and um, prone to terrorism and so on, which, which is quite scary um, and has its own dangers in terms of you know, human rights people being detained, even, even uh, you know, assaulted, killed, etc., uh, because they are Muslims. Um, on the other hand, I think some of the, the uh, multicultural, um, att uh, the attempts to oppose uh, this through multiculturalism um, also have their pitfalls. For example, the struggle for uh, or the demand that there should be more um, Muslim schools. Now, I do uh, recognize that, okay, there are so many, um, you know, Catholic and Church of England schools that it may be a very big agenda to say, you know, get rid of them, <laughs> or rather to make them secular. Um, but I would think surely that is the way one should be uh, going to say that our aim ultimately is to ensure that all state-funded schools at least are secular and not to argue for 
more and more religions to have state-funded schools, you know, where which would be exclusively for people of that religion or predominantly for them. And um, I mean, there are so many problems with that. The children will not mix with children of other religions. They, you know, they. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm all in favor of them being taught their own religion, but not in a state school. I mean, they, there's, there are so many other uh, possibilities for them to be taught if their parents want them to be taught a certain religion. They can do it outside the school. So this this demand for more um, minority religious schools, I think is not one which I would go along with. And again, I think a, a sort of very strong secular uh, agenda would be more, uh, in the long run, would be better able to counteract the Islamophobia, which is definitely rampant, but it should be counteracted from a secular rather than a, um, a secular perspective, rather than one which maybe leans towards encouraging you know, separate religious schools. No, it's not just against Islam. That is absolutely true. But um, I think, at least recently, uh, in the last few years, there is an element also of Islamophobia. Certainly, this the the, the racism, for example, um, yeah, that was one example that was given. Is say be between Bosnian Muslims and um, Eritrean Muslims. There is definitely a difference in the way they are treated, and obviously there that is pure and simple racism against the Eritreans because the Bosnians are white. On the other hand, Bosnian Muslims would be seen differently from other Slavs, you know, other East European, uh, East Europeans who, who come to Britain. Um, and there I think the difference is because they are Muslims rather than Christians. Whatever. So I think there is the. Uh, I, I think you're right that the predominant thing is racism, but in people's minds, they, I think the constant bombardment of the notion of, of uh, Muslims being terrorists. Um, it. Uh, I think it has had an effect, and that that does. Uh, it it does. Of course, just the way as when, uh, you know, like, um, say 40 years ago or 30 years ago, um, every brown-skinned person was called a Paki, and that was a form of racism. But now they might, well, just the way that, like that Sikh man was, was uh, hammered in the U.S. because he wore a turban and he was, they thought he was a Muslim. I mean, now, likewise, people who are not Muslims, might be uh, uh, targeted because they uh, are seen as Muslims. So I think it is complicated, but there is, uh, I think there's an element of both, uh, which of prejudice against people, both on the grounds of religion as well as on the grounds of race. And certainly, I mean, if you look at India, it is clearly on the grounds of religion in um, this association between Muslims and terrorism. Um, I think there is, there is an element of that. Much of it is racism, but I think there is also some, some co I mean, just the way you have prejudice in some circles against Jews, um, again, that is not, uh, it, it is similar to racism, but it is not quite the same as racism, um, anti-Semitism. So I think there is a, a parallel uh, kind of prejudice developing, I mean, very recently against Muslims, as Muslims, and not just as, you know, uh, not just as uh, whatever, Asians or black people.